come to the third day of our summit. Um, I think it went too fast, uh, but I hope you enjoyed and gained uh, a lot. Uh, and now, um, you know, we'll summarize in the end. Okay, I liked better the first vision when you see everything, but you know, life is not everything that we want. So um, as I said, it was too short and it went too fast, but I hope you gained and you have your, everyone his own take home message. And based on the uh, discussions, and I thank you for that, for this fruitful brainstorming in the various disciplines, from medical health to geology to zoology, botany, uh, and seismology up till uh, languages. So, you know, we covered all this area. In all, based on that, we want to look now, or we dare to look now, uh, where is science going in the next 10 years? And in order to do that, um, I'm, I'm going to invite our chairperson, Professor Mauro, Mauro, Mauro Ferrari. I was looking at you and I lost my words. No, no, don't, 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 don't steal my program. All right, ladies and gentlemen, delight to be with you today again. And uh, I would be honored if I was the person serving you coffee in this room. The job was already taken, so I get to be the chair. I'm still very, 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 very honored. It is, uh, you're showing all of my secret slides. My friend, okay, here we go, terrific. So this conference indeed has gone too fast. It's been an incredible opportunity for me to learn from so many of you in so many different areas and topics, a true privilege. So let's roll up our sleeves again, and uh, uh, I get uh, to open the dances a little bit and talk about the challenges being the future, the future of science, the next 10 years. Where do we go in the next 10 years? I hope I get to come here in the next 10 years a few times. But of course, that depends if they'll invite me again. I will talk about my experiences that I summarized joyfully as 25 years of failures. And those failures have given me an idea about where I think we need to go. And I hope I'll go with you all as we get to those places, some pretty lofty challenges. So, so it's a journey that I'm going to be describing. I'm not going to talk about that institutional of course, programs I've described those the day before yesterday already a little bit, so I will talk about my, my personal research trajectory that is uh, 25 years in, in the making, 25 years of failures, uh, with uh, starting from uh, University of California at Berkeley, where I was for 15 years and a number of other places, and culminating where we are right now, and hopefully the next steps will continue to take us in the right direction. I'll take you through a few words that you are familiar with and perhaps some that you are not familiar with, the general notion is that with every step of the way from nanomedicine to transport oncophysics to multi-stage vectors to generators of particles, we try to learn from the previous failures and try to put in a fix towards what is a pretty extreme objective, talking about life in the extreme here in a moment, and it is the objective. Monumental testimonial to my encyclopedic stupidity. When I started 25 years ago working on medical topics, kind of looked around and said, well, what do people die of when they have cancer? Well, the answer is the vast majority is metastatic disease to the lungs and to the liver. Well, let's work on that. As simple as that. The pretty extreme challenges so that we can do this thing that right now you are taught not to ever even dream of, let alone write in a grant or write in a big paper, cure metastatic disease. To lungs and liver in particular, that will cure 80% of morbidity and, morbidity and mortality due to cancer. So that has been the challenge. Life on the extreme is the general overriding theme of, overarching theme of this conference, and that's what we're gonna talk about. But before I do this, I would like to introduce my son Giacomo and my dog Camillo. Giacomo's birthday, 30th birthday, is today. As a matter of fact, right now, he's turning 30. He's in Seattle, Washington. If you do the math, he's turning 30. And a dedicated father and family... What? First time, I think he was... <laughs> okay, very good. So he's still hanging on. 
and uh, there would be no other place that I would be missing his birthday than something that I care about and a group that is as exciting as you are, all of you here. So thanks for this opportunity. So I want to tell you how much I love all of you and this opportunity to be here. But of course, equal opportunity here. This is the rest of the family. So Paula, you've already met. She's right here. This is Giacomo. These are Kim and Chiara. They are twins. And they are both cartoonists for the movies. And Giacomo is a computer scientist. And these are my second twins, our second twins. That's Ilaria and Federica, an engineer going to medical school. And then she's a, a model and a number of other things, getting a degree in, in, the, in the, you know, public health. And uh, twins and twins, I know what you're thinking. I'm not going to talk to you about reproductive technologies at all. We actually like things done the old-fashioned way. Thank you very much, <laughs> if you need to tell the truth. All right, so this is the only slide that I hope that you will, that, that, that I hope that you will remember. So look at these fellas. These guys right here, they all have metastatic disease. It comes from different forms of triple negative breast cancer. So they would all be destined to die as are all of the patients that we have in clinics that have metastatic disease to lungs and liver. Only thing is, with this treatment that I will talk to you about, uh, they turn out to be long-term survivors. They are completely healed of their disease, and uh, they go on to live as long as the little mates that never had cancer to start with. Hundreds and hundreds of different animals, multiple different models, and so we think we may be on to something. And I want to describe that to you. In particular, what happens with these mice is that uh, this notion of uh, the, 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 the onset of resistance to, to treatment uh, doesn't take place. So this is one treatment. A treatment comprises three different injections of this drug that I will show you in a moment, which is not even a drug. You know, it's not even a drug. I cannot call it a drug. I will when I go to the FDA in a couple of weeks, but it is not even a drug. We need to rethink things a little bit. But you see, with conventional drugs or treatments any which way you want, the burden of cancer reduces, then it comes back. You go through a few treatments, and then you lose the patient. Very, very difficult situation, of course, for everybody in the clinic. So first approach to trying to do something in addition to what was already done. You are all familiar with the fact that chemotherapy does not cure metastatic disease. Biological therapies with monoclonals and whatever do not cure. They do good things, God bless them. They extend life, they do all sorts of wonderful things that I'm all in favor, but there is no such a thing as guaranteeing cure. So when I came into this, I was coming from a te technology world, uh, the math and physics and stuff like that. And so we were starting to think about the fact that perhaps nano could help. So I had put together the national program at the National Cancer Institute. I directed the launch of the, the formulation and launch of that operation with the help of a lot of extraordinary people that helped out. And that program now, 15 years later, in its third offering already, has given rise to perhaps 5 to 10% of all cancer drugs in the clinic in the US being nanodrugs. Very rapid growth. If you look by comparison of recombinant DNA biotechnology that took longer to get drugs to the clinic, but it doesn't solve the problem of metastasis. It doesn't, for a number of reasons. So we said, OK, what's next? We started thinking about next, why doesn't it solve the problem of metastasis? Well, one big reason is that whatever you inject in the body, be that the chemotherapeutic agent, a biological micromolecule, or a nanoparticle, to get to where you need it, even if it has great specificity of action, he has to cross a number of biological barriers, which are the things that truly direct traffic to the right places. Recognition at the end is wonderful, but it comes way, way, way downstream. And the vast, vast, vast majority of what you're injecting people never makes it to the point where they can recognize a target antigen. 99.99 .99 and a bunch of other nines. Doesn't get there. So the problem is how do you cross all of these barriers in an intelligent fashion? Well, all of a sudden, this looks like a problem that combines biology with physics, with math, with chemistry. It's a truly transdisciplinary, superdisciplinary problem. Turns out that you can actually develop a general framework for how you can direct nanoparticles to different parts in the body preferentially. You can skew, if you will, the biodistribution by a few degrees by just working on physical parameters that you can do you design parameters as you make the nanoparticles. You can make a bigger, smaller, round, spherical, or we can make them cylindrical, disc-like, and whatever else, more charge, less charge, more density, less density. All of these upstream of biological recognition, and you can make huge changes in the biodistribution. Good. 
It is all about the biological barriers. You have to figure out a way to cross them in a way that is preferential towards accumulation in the target tissues that you want. And we wrote a lot about that. Here is a listing of those barriers. I don't know what I just did. Here it is. Here is a listing of those barriers. You can break them down with more sophisticated biology into multiple subsystems. I think I lost the audio. But I can sing Gregorian chant. It's the Italian thing to do. Localizing a rex. Okay, I can do that. I want to sing. And so, given that we live in Houston, Texas, and if there is one thing everyone knows about Houston, Texas, is NASA, Houston, I have a problem. So, a few years back, we thought you have to cross the sequence of biological barriers. Is the voice back or should I sing more? Sing? Oh, yes. Multi stage. <laughs> Multi stage systems right here. We came up with things to get to the rocket, you need three stages. Rocket to the moon, you need three stages metastasis in the lung is a lot harder. You think you can do it with a single molecule? I think otherwise. So we came up with this crazy notion of three stages to get things to the right place, or maybe more. So, so we, get to, we get the idea, get some traction, we get publication. You see the first stage is designed to get preferentially into the, the, the capillary bed that fits the tumor because of its physical characteristics, as I briefly described earlier on. And then you carry a second stage, which is typically a nanoparticle, and then that carries an active payload. And you actually make everything so that it is biodegradable, bioresorbable, without harmful effects. So you got some things that you can think about right there. So a few areas come up. This notion of multi-stage vector has been picked up by a few other groups. But this was almost 10 years ago already, I'm embarrassed to admit. You can develop a ton of science around how you design those particles using physical approaches using mathematics so that you can optimally design so that in the characteristics of flow that are typical of the metastatic deposits that you want to target, and those are very different from blood flow in the rest of the body, you can design so that you will have preferential accumulation on the blood vessel walls that you want to target. It's all math. It's a ton of math. Ten years of work to get to ideal size and shape type of distributions and charge so that you can get the particles to the place where you want to get them. At this point, I'm going to show you very quickly a few applications of this, and then I'll come back to what the real fundamental problems are that need the take, excuse me, that take us to the next level. The bad news is this doesn't cure metastatic disease, but it does a bunch of good things. You can do SNA therapeutics to identify, for instance, uh, to, to identify, for instance, drivers or certain classes of triple negative. You can have breast cancer. You can apply this to get to the bone marrow. This actually also uses biological targeting in addition to the physical targeting that I talked to you about so that you can take out the niches in the bone marrow that are associated with the onset and recurrence of leukemia. You can do better contrast agents using uh, carbon nanotubes as secondary stages inside of the silicon particles. The first stage particles are silicon particles. I don't know if I mentioned. You can add some biology on top of these, essentially covering these particles uh, with cell membranes so that you can increase the transport properties. And we have done a number of different ways. Uh, you can actually help uh, immunotherapeutic approaches become more efficient, essentially transporting or vectoring the antigens that you need to release to trigger the right immune cells so they will do the things that they need to do. And all of this got published all over the place. It's good and it's exciting. And I've been you know, happy to be involved in all of the above, but it doesn't cure metastatic disease. But, OK, back to the story. So we started up launching cancer nanotechnology. This, I think, was the first publication. They put the two words, cancer and nanotechnology, together in a major journal at the days that we were at the NCI. Then I retired to private life, uh, and I started working putting together multidisciplinary centers of the types that we are talking about right here. This is the right environment, I think, for the right challenges, truly multidisciplinary, superdisciplinary, as we said yesterday. And as we were studying transport properties using these nanoparticles and these multi-stage systems, this notion was coming up very loud and clear, in particular looking at the control experiments uh, that a transport of mass in cancer tissue is different than what you would expect in the counterpart healthy tissue. So we came up with the notion that we perhaps we could call those differences transport oncophysics. Cool. And then the same guys that asked to write the, the story, uh, that, uh, 
they launched cancer nanotechnology, they started asking, okay, how about tell us more about these transport oncophysics things? So we put it together, we sent it in, we kind of got published, and a number of people started working on this. Same story, started putting together a national center with investigators from different institutions, a center for transport oncophysics, trying to learn and apply the lessons that come from the basic science analysis of the transport differentials based on biological barriers, apply those to design new classes of drugs. But they already told you that nanoparticles fail to cure metastatic disease to lungs and liver that I've seen. Smarter people may be able to do this, but not me. Now, I told you that multi-stage doesn't work. And now we know a lot of transport oncophysics. We need a different idea. And that is where that came up. Actually, currently, we have a national center also that applies these notions to immunotherapeutics. And that is nice and exciting. So back to this darn thing here. So rather than telling you the philosophy, why don't I tell you a bit how this works? How do we get to having so many long, about 50% of the animals are cured? And I'm expecting, in particular in this place right here, that when I say metastatic and cured in the same sentence, there should be like a lightning bolt coming down from the high heavens and striking me dead. But it hasn't happened yet. So here is how it works. The first stage, the silicon particles are designed, as I told you before, so that they will concentrate and stick to the blood vessel walls in tumor-associated angiogenesis, preferentially. You don't need 100%, you don't need 90%. If you can reduce uptake in the liver by 1%, you'll get a 100% increase in the tumors, just order of magnitude-wise. So you can do a lot of that physical targeting. Inside of this biodegradable silicon particle, poro silicon particle that you saw on the cover of Nature Nanotech a moment ago, I have three more ingredients. That's why I cannot call this a drug. I got a silicon disc, which qualifies as an excipient per the FDA uh, nomenclature. Inside of that, I have a little strand of a certain polymeric backbone, linear backbone, attached to that uh, through a pH-sensitive linker I have molecules of my warhead, if you will, in this case is doxorubicin. Here is the doxorubicin. And inside of the pores of the particles, they are just linear strands with these things attached in preferred locations. As the particle degrades and these guys come out, they, by thermodynamics, they are forced to take the shape of a nanoparticle. All right? So I don't have nanoparticles inside of here but I release nanoparticle in the tumor in a microenvironment. Why that? Because the first lesson from nature was that you need to deliver the drug in things that look like cells, just molecule is not enough. What is that? Things that have the rudimentary components of cells, that's the multi-stage vectors. I need to take another lesson from nature here. Lesson from nature is the cells that want to exchange biological mass will do that uh, through an intelligent process uh, that employs exosomes and intracellular trafficking. So I need to be able to deliver something that will take the shape of an exosome-like thing that the stem cells that are in the cancer cells, in the cancer microenvironment, they are responsible for repopulating after chemotherapy, right? That what we call the, the therapy-resistant cells, the tumor-initiating cell cells. Those are the ones that I want to target and to do that, I need to feed them things that look like things that they want to bring in, uh, like exosomes. So they will take to the place where I want them to be delivered, which is in the lysosomes surrounding the nucleus, uh, where the pH is very low, acidity is very high. So here it is. So I am making, this is the key differential. We are making nanoparticles inside of the tumor microenvironment. If I inject them upstream, it doesn't work. They all end up in the liver. This way it works, they are made locally after I cross a number of barriers, and then I take a shape of a nanoparticle that is exosome-like. At that point, I can get transported to where I want. And where I want is right here. pH is really low. At this point, I release doxorubicin. Why is that important? It's released inside of the cell, far away from the defense mechanisms, far away from the defense mechanisms, from the MDR pumps, the efflux pumps. They will get their buckets and kick the drug out if you just feed it to it by conventional diffusion, for instance, all right? So I can get, I can deploy the action past, if you will, past the anti-aircraft carriers bombing the, 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 the places inside of, the, of the, the enemy territory that I want to get. Is this a drug? I don't think so. Don't tell the FDA. 
it's a system. It certainly has got some bios, got some this, got some that. It's complicated. Hey, cancer is complicated. That's why we've not been able to solve it with conventional approaches. At least that's one of the reasons. So this is life in extreme uh, environments, trying to solve this problem. We found it a bit difficult. 25 years later, we get this publication in Nature, and people say, oh, exciting, thank you. And then we send, send out a little summer, uh, additional piece of information that says, and by the way, guys, we made this GMP. We've invested millions of dollars to be the only manufacturing place in the world that can do this GMP, pharmaceutical grade. Come and check it out. Boom, all of a sudden I get all the pharma world coming and talking to me. That's the big difference. That's what we were talking about yesterday. Great that you can do basic science. Show me it's reproducible. Show you can manufacture. Show me you can scale it up. It's a different world than it was 20 years ago. So this is the theme. So we go to the Department of Defense. We get uh, the, the only uh, uh, breakthrough award level four, $16 million. We are, we are, so to support us all the way through phase one and phase two clinical trials, Talk about revolutionary concepts here, so everything is inside of the hospital. I have my own CRO facility, if you will, inside the hospital with external auditors, of course. And talk about life in extreme conditions. This program is governed in this uh, governing committee. Three out of the five, the majority votes, are cancer patients. Life in the extreme environment. Oh, look, surprise. We are at the service of our patients. I like that. I like that very, very much. I like that very, very much. So that's an extreme uh, concept, perhaps, to think about for the next years. And unfortunately, Lori was the only metastatic patient. I mean, these guys have 18 to 24 months live on average, life expectancy. Lori just died. And uh, we are dedicating this program to her. God bless her. But you would be surprised, or perhaps not, how this, having these people in leadership positions involved helps focus and not be distracted by all sorts of other exciting stuff that, of course, we are all, uh, of course, uh, open and exposed and attracted to. This gives a focus, but perhaps a lesson for the next 10 years. So conclusions. All right, if you want to cure cancer, you need to take care of lung and liver meds if you want to do the big numbers. Key is to eliminate the therapy-resistant cells. You cannot do this with chemo, bio, this and that, and the other is not that I could find or anybody else at this point. Cannot do it with multi-stage vectors either. You can learn something for transport oncophysics, and then if you develop a way to make nanoparticles that are exosome-like inside of the microenvironment of the metastasis, then you get the results that you saw. Uh, hopefully, there is a simpler way to do that, but you know we couldn't come up with one, so we had to come up with this four-component system. Now, let's talk about some ideas for the future. Huh? Optimal design algorithm based on various scores. Now look at how we, we, we the taxonomy of cancer. If you look at you know places of origin in the body of the disease, that's 300 years old type of science. We still use it. Think about of course molecular signatures. Great, a bit more of these are two are two plus uh, three plus. I use this drug. Science numbers quantitation. Come on. All of a sudden, if you can put in a barrier score, I don't care what drug you use as long as it kills a cell in the process of division. Dr. Rubicin is old and stupid, but the intelligent part is in the transport. So we can get quantitative in different ways and go from a, this is a long story, from a discrete target approach as we do in molecular biology to a continuum variable approach that I can discretize in different ways. Uh, personalizing it, perhaps. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? Key, practically speaking, key to make sure that all of this uh, kind of makes sense to the GMP manufacturing part of the story. And the question was asked, how do you deal with computational strategies? Everything we have done here, a few of the movies are not working. Everything we've done so far, you know, I'm trained as a mathematical physicist. I see the world in differential equations. That they have some predictive powers if you can fix the right parameters or right. There's no way to live anymore. That's good for a certain point, point of uh, evolution of knowledge in humankind. We are in a different place in life. You're going to hear from Dario Gill some spectacular stories in a moment. Uh, we're in a different moment in life. Perhaps I don't need to synthesize knowledge in the format of a predictive differential equation. We can use machine learning, artificial intelligence, perhaps different strategies that can pick up information directly from radiological imaging for the various movies that we already make inside of people in all cancer clinics around the world, they don't even know what transperiodical physics is. It's part of the normal diagnostic routine. And of course, 
together with molecular signatures that you get from pathology and let the darn machines figure it out and tell me exactly how to design these multi-stage particles and vectors is a different is a different day that integrates multiple disciplines not because one is better than the other but because they all need to work together so from biology and biology and chemistry we need to add all sorts of other stuff so that we can move from cell level biology is what you use for cancer therapy today to multi-level all the way to systemic transport perspective and uh, the transition fundamentally the way you think of your variables in solving the cancer problem and uh, perhaps uh, other stuff from drugs to whatever the heck it is that these things are I don't even know and uh, I will leave you with this part in thought after these 25 years of failures uh, ask people what cancer is we all know Anahan and Weinberg okay collection of 14 different uh, phenomenological observations if you will correct perfect wonderful very deep god bless them i love them where is the unifying principle where is the fundamental perspective they're all driven by genes okay i know that what is the fundamental describing umbrella you know coming from the mathematical physics world i always said the desire to have one of those uh, and uh, maybe they, they don't apply but just the way I, I think for better or for worse so i'm thinking that uh, this is what cancer is it's not the way to treat cancer is what cancer is is a disruption of traffic patterns inside of a body for different types of masses that takes effect because of disruptions in carcinogenesis or biological barriers learn what those are you cure cancer and with that in mind so this is there was the journey now we are the clinical trial stage but the thing is just a starting point and I thank you very much for your attention and I think I've spoken a bit too much and I was really trying not to speak too long and I apologize for that because we have such a cadre of spectacular legendary speakers two questions no I'm happy to take questions but I'm so eager to introduce our next wonderful speakers yes ma'am I follow whatever Mira says and my wife I can hear you please no thank you Ha. Ha. Thank you. Of course, with so much history around here, the Trojan horse is, is the kind of a thought that comes to mind. Thank you so much. If you think back of the Odyssey, the Odyssey, so they laid siege, the, 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 the Greeks laid siege to Troy for all those bloody 10 years. And then all of a sudden, one day, the Trojans wake up and they look outside of the city of Troy and on the beach, they don't see any Romans and any Greeks left. And they just see this big horse. So they say, fine, war is over. What do we do with this horse? Let's bring it into the city. What can go wrong, right? Well, it turns out the cancer cells are a bit smarter than the Trojans of old. And if you just give them a Trojan horse, <laughs> put it there, don't smell right. It don't smell right. You have to figure it out a way for them to bring it in. If you feed them the naked drug or the naked nanoparticle, there is also some protection systems, in particular for the therapy resistant cells. That's why they are therapy resistant. So what you need to do is figure out a way to bring the components to assemble. It's like IKEA therapeutics. Okay, you have to give them the components and the tools to assemble the nanoparticles inside of the tumor microenvironment. Otherwise, they're not going to bring it in. That was the hardest part of the 25 years. So you need to give them things and use the only thing you have, the only tool you have, they don't have nano hammers. You have thermodynamics. Force them to collapse into particles that look like exosomes. At that point, the cells bring in the stuff to transport mechanism and still smells bad. That's why they put it into lysosomes, the garbage disposal. And at that point, the drugs are lived next to a nucleus boom, and that's why it works. So it is a Trojan horse, but of a different variety. Odysseus had an easier time because he was playing against weaker defenses. Those cells are a lot smarter. Thank you for the question. Yes, sir. What? People can't hear me? Yes. The, the difficulty with cancer, as you well know, is that there are a lot of cells that are resembling these cells, which are, after all, host cells. They're just run around. They're no longer controlled.
but there are lots of other stem cells that are growing or cells that are replicating within yeah. the system. So yes. how do you deliver which it? Is you why want to target it and deliver it. Which is why you don't want to use individual drugs. They don't have a smart transport system that goes with them. This localization of the thing that you deploy is based in the multi-stage approach. Each of the stages crosses preferentially biological barriers in a way to get stuff. It's like a filter that increases probability every step of the way. That's why you get to have a few more percentages. That's all you need in the cancer lesion. So, so it's a game of math and multiple pieces of transport. Do you physically deliver it to the location within the body close to the, no, where the cancer is? No, systemic injection. So it finds its way. Uh -huh. Among because, all the other yes. differentiating cells. Yes, I, yes, there is, I had to leave a few things out. There was the one part, the one, the, the one slide where I showed the Reynolds lecture, where I showed these things for the first time. Uh, it's uh, uh, the characteristics of blood flow in the capillaries in tumor-associated angiogenesis that feed in particular those things that have become my fixation, metastasis to the lungs. The characteristics of flow are physically very different than anywhere else in the body. The shear stress of the wall is different. There are certain characteristics that you need to play by. That I can, we have formulas for that that have to do with uh, length of the capillary, imagination velocity, but the key fundamental variable is shear stress, uh, shear stress of the wall. There's the deformation that you see at the wall in the characteristics of flow is that it develops in the capillary. If you design your boat for whitewater rafting is a different boat than you would have to go through the swamps or the bayous in Houston. So use physics like you guys do at NASA to develop it right so that imaginate quickly enough so that it can catch on the blood vessel walls. As it comes in, it don't go out. Everywhere else in the body, it doesn't have enough time to marginate, so the concentrations that you get in capillary beds everywhere else in the body is marginal, no pun intended. Okay, so it's physics. Thank you. Very nice. Now she says, I gotta, you see, the term is do, then she tells me don't, she's like my wife. Oh no, one more. Yes. No, no, my love. And then I promise I get out of here and introduce the real so speakers. What is a trick that the drug is not eaten up by macrophages? Oh, it is, and we love it. Thank you. Thanks. So the way you want to get into things, you have to catch a ride everywhere you can. Macrophages are the uber of the biological system. I call them up, they pick them up. That's why it works in the immunotherapeutics, in the, the immunotherapeutics, which is the story that I've not told about yet. It works, it works. They are picked up and if I can catch rides on macrophages that go deep inside the tumors, God bless them. They're not gonna be hurt by Dr. Rubicin. And when on the other application they do the, the immunological things, they release things shortly, slowly over time. And that is perfectly okay because it's a matter of skewing biological distribution. This fairy tale of 100%, 90%, 80% is the fairy tale of fairy tales. We've all been fooled by that for many, many years. Any drug you inject, you know, the concentration of, say, conventional chemotherapeutic agents, the concentration that you get at the tumor, if you are on a good day, is 0.01% of a biologically targeted drug on a good day is a hundredfold worse, 0 0.0001. Come on, we have heard so many fairy tales, it's time to call it what it is. Thank you for the question.